Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, m and Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citizens Bank, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Marinkoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Technology. All this money, billions of dollars being invested in technology, especially for real estate. Why are people investing? What are they investing in? So today, with the help of my executive producer, the oldest member in the panel next to me, okay, we have three tech guys who are going to tell themselves what they're doing and also Mr. Money Behind the Money Bags is going to talk. So I'm going to allow each one to introduce themselves and introduce their company. Sam. Sure. Um, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Sam Bernstein. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called LoftSmart. We're the first end-to-end -end marketplace for all the rental real estate. So we're a marketplace like Kayak or TripAdvisor for um, all the rental real estate in, in student housing markets. And so what end-to-end -end means is that we have the discovery product where you can come and search and browse local listings. And we have tens of thousands of reviews and ratings by prior residents. You can take a VR tour. Um, but we also have a booking product effectively where you can apply, sign, and pay instantly on the marketplace so you don't have to work with a broker and you can do the transaction directly on the same platform where you And you search. even have a relationship with somebody where you can get lease security, right? Yeah, that's right. We have a partner called Jetty. Um, they have a product called the Passport Deposit product that allows uh, qualified renters to pay 17.5% of the full value of the security deposit and they create an insurance contract with the property manager um, you know, for the full value of, of the security deposit. And your age? I'm 23. And how much money have you raised so far? We've raised $5 million. Okay, next, on uh, the appraisal world. I'm John Meadows, I'm the co-CEO of Bowery Valuation. Um, we are the first ever truly tech-enabled commercial appraisal firm. So we built a technology, I came from the appraisal world, so we built a technology essentially for ourselves, our dream technology for ourselves as appraisers. Um, and we leveraged that technology our appraisers use it internally to deliver reports that are higher quality, greater consistency, greater data accuracy at faster delivery times and lower costs to our lending clients. And how long are you in business? Uh, we started in June of 2015. In the order, you are next in age at 29. I am 29, and we've raised a little over $7 million. Next, Mr. Mortgage. The, uh, the age thing is a little, a little tough from the regression. Don't worry, but, I'll get it. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if I... Could I, I, <laughs> you introduce this, yourself and tell yes. us a little bit uh, about Mr. Mortgage? Uh, I'm Brian Fox. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Morty, 
Morty is a digitally native, full service mortgage marketplace. So what does that mean? A residential mortgage. For residential mortgages, yes. Uh, so digitally native, it's just that. It's, uh, it's modern, it's online, it is uh, rooted in technology. No paper, no you know superfluous middlemen. Uh, it's full service in that we like to say we take people from first click all the way to closing day. And then the um, the real core differentiator is that we're a marketplace. We partner with top lenders, um, you know Quicken Loans, for example, who is now the number one residential mortgage lender in our country. Um, we have 15 different partners, all the best uh, array uh, of products, pricing, so that the consumer gets that combination of full service and the right product uh, that fits them. And your age? You're at 33? I am, I am 33, uh, young at heart, but uh, yes. Looks, uh, looks 25. I, I, appreciate I agree. That. <laughs> I appreciate that. And, and the old man in the group, you are? Jeffrey Berman from Canberra Creek. Uh, we invest in enterprise technology uh, germane to the built world. So that means that anything that touches the built real estate environment and that has a, a potential tech solution to a pain point that everybody in real estate has felt, we will look at investing in. And I am the eldest person in this round table, and I'm over 21. <laughs> and you are 39. Oh. So here's the question. How do you create the kayak for dormitories? How sure. Does, how did this come about, Mr. Yelp? Yeah. Um, you know, I started the business when I was a student at the University of Virginia in 2015. Um, the basic premise was to create uh, Yelp for real estate locally, and so a transparent platform where um, you know, primarily folks could come and not just see what was out there in the market, but also get some information, some, you know, intel from folks who had lived there before in the vein of a TripAdvisor or Yelp or, you know, other sort of well-established online platforms that have been created uh, for the purpose of, of creating transparency in markets. And so what we did was, you know, we created the platform. We worked really hard to generate a lot of review content on it for local real estate. And then what we did was we ultimately came to property managers and management companies and developers. And what we said was, you know, we've created this community where folks are coming to make decisions about where to live. Um, help us, you know, allow us to help you guys convert some of those prospects, um, not just as eyeballs, but, you know, turn those eyeballs into, into renters, into tenants of your buildings. So how do you monetize? How sure. do you make money? So because we're the first uh, listing platform that actually facilitates the transactions, rather than if you think about like an apartments.com or a Zillow, you know, what you would do on those platforms is, is basically submit a lead or an inquiry. Um, you know, you, we take you through the whole process. And so because we actually deliver converted re you know, residents rather than leads, we are able to take a percentage of the full year contract value. Do you have to get licensed in the state? We're not a brokerage, um, nor do we really handle any of the brokerage activities. And so we don't do showings and um, you, you know, we don't perform the traditional functions of a broker. We're actually just a tech platform that connects residents and property managers in that direct. So who's paying you? The, the property owner is paying you? Yes, property owners pay us. Okay, what about the property managers? Um, well, property managers pay us through the property owners. Okay, so fine. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I fell into the appraisal space right out of college, uh, working for your friend Joel Leitner. I uh, always had kind of thoughts of going to law school and was becoming interested in real estate. And a friend of mine from Penn recruited me at this commercial appraisal firm in New York City, which at the time was the largest independent firm in the city. Um, and I recruited my friend from growing up, six months in, and we worked there together for four years. Um, and I think the best businesses come from need. And for us, it was a very, very personal need. We were spending 12 to 14 hours, five, six days a week appraising every day. Um, and we experienced the, the pain points that we're trying to solve 12 hours every single day. And but how do you decide to go into the business? Yeah, so I mean, it took us about a week on the job to realize that the tools that we had to produce these reports, which are you know, 100, 150 pages long, um, were highly antiquated, essentially designed and stuck somewhere between 1985 and 1995. And come 2015, when we'd built up enough expertise in the space, um, and we started really looking under the hood and seeing that not just our independent firm, but the largest appraisal firms in the world were using the same technology that we had internally, you know, Word and Excel documents using a past template from an old report. Um, and so when we started really seeing that there was absolutely no technological solution out there, we felt like we were in a position to build that. We had the expertise built up. 
um, met our third co-founder, who is our year at Princeton, uh, you know, really talented engineer. So you're an appraiser. Yep. Your other partner? An appraiser, co-CEO. So we are not MAIs. Um, we have four state licensed appraisers and two MAIs. And what's your staff. third partner? Um, he's our CTO. So he was, he was the one who's built up our technology initially. And, and what helped you grow? You have a strategic relationship with Cushman and Wakefield, correct? We do. Um, so we started talking to them all the way back in January of last year. Um, they basically saw, they, they became aware of our technology through an accelerator called Metaprop. Um, and, and were fortunately very forward thinking in thinking about how to solve the same pain points that we were experiencing and their appraisers were experiencing. And they saw that we had built the leading technology in the industry. And for them, they were doing things the same way as everyone else. And they understood that you can't keep staying you know, in your old ways if you're gonna really progress. Um, so for us, we saw an opportunity. They have a great brand, we have a great technology. Rather than just trying to collide and, and butt heads as we started to grow, let's work together and actually rise you know, both the ships. So. Right, but in the same manner that he started a business, what caused the, the change? Was it pricing? Okay, you know, you, you were creating Yelp in, yeah. in a way, but was it pricing to the customer? Speed is important, but pricing was also important. Yeah, I mean, both are crucial. And for us, it originally stemmed from the work of the appraiser. So what, if you talk to lenders, a lot of times they'll tell you that the appraisal is one of the biggest headaches for them in the entire process. And for us, that's an unfortunate reality because we know appraisers are experts in their space, very intelligent, very hardworking. So to have that gap, clearly there's an issue with the tools the appraisers have to produce these reports. But he, here's the question. He, he's yeah. in the dormitory business, okay? You know, in, in the apartment business for, do, for mostly college students and so on. Appraisal, there's a different type of appraisal product. Residential is one type of appraisal. Yep. Office building is another. Hospitality assets is another. Industrial is another. Data centers. Are you doing all types of appraisals, or or are you limited to just the yeah? So residential. You know, we're an appraisal firm based in New York City. We handle any asset. We have two MAIs on our staff, four state licensed appraisers. You know, over 40 years experience in the industry. Um, so anything that's sent our way, we handle those appraisals. Our software and our technology today is built out for the multifamily mixed use space in the five boroughs. But you can still do appraisals for any- We can do anything. Yeah, right. Um, today, the majority of it is in the multifamily. That's correct. Which is a large area in the New York City market. That's correct. Place. And that was one of the things that excited Cushman because for them, historically, that's not a space they've really competed in aggressively just because the margins don't make sense on those kind of lower touch assets for a firm of that size. And now by partnering with us, with both a referral model going out and sending co-branded appraisals that we produce internally, as well as a white label model, what we're delivering our software for them to use internally themselves, and now compete in this multifamily mixed use space, which historically has not really made sense for them. Mr. Fox. Well, let me say that uh, I will second that the appraisal piece is uh, one of the most painful <laughs> and time consuming. Um, Especially since you're in the lending business. Yeah, my, my backstory is really easy. Um, I have been in um, you know some facet of mortgage or residential real estate my entire life. Um, started when I was 18, since we already said my age uh, earlier on, I think the people can do the math, but I was fortunate enough to have a, a this mentor. This is not the bachelorette, so don't yeah. worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. To, I'll keep that in mind. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a, a mentor who uh, was nice enough to you know, take me along and he was going places. He ran residential at Freddie Mac, lending at Wells Fargo, um, all the way up into uh, the housing crisis where he was appointed federal housing commissioner. So you know, being um, inside the government, uh, you know, trying to help people uh, from uh, anything from, you know, not losing their homes or, you know, reducing principal, everything uh, borrower, um, you know, kind of advocacy related, you kind of, you know, you really realize who does what in this industry, um, you know, how it's built, how it functions. And so uh, after three years there, I went back into the business and I was just so like unimpassioned by anything. And I left and I didn't know if I was gonna ever get back into the business. And uh, I met my co-founders and I didn't know anything about technology. I don't know anything about startups. Like it was basically like stuff I saw on TV shows. And, and like the three of us as a team formed that kind of you know perfect combination of technology. So What's your specialty and what is their specialty? So, uh, you know, you can uh, deminimize my specialty to like, I'm the mortgage guy. Like I, uh, you know. I called you uh, Mr. Mortgage. Yeah, and, I, and I'm fine with that. Look, um, 
there's a lot more to the sausage making of mortgages than, than people know. But the other thing is that if you want to actually improve the process, if you want to own the consumer experience, you got to get licensed. You have to be an originator. The technology, the advertising sites, I'm not going to name any names, but you know that doesn't actually fix what's broken. And so we made a conscious decision to not only have a great technology platform, but to go through the state-by-state -state licensing process be an originator and like, you know, take the regulatory scrutiny for the good of the consumer. And how do you make your money? So we get paid uh, a commission from the lender uh, if and when a loan closes, but that commission is fixed, it's flat. We are completely unbiased as to which lender, which product, um, no attribute of the loan matters to us. So it's really up to the borrower to, you know, use our tools and, and our guidance to find the right mortgage for them. And who's your competitors? You know, uh, I go back and forth on this. I, I think it's a little bit cheesy to say we have no natural competitors, but when we started Morty, um, you know, we didn't want to get into a, a $10.4 trillion industry tackling uh, Wells Fargo and Quicken head on. So we found a way to build a platform that shares in the economics, plays nice with incumbents. As I mentioned, you know, Quicken is our, our number one partner. Um, you know, they're great. They look at Morty as an acquisition channel, as a source of really high quality, high performing. Um, I'll give assets. you a good example. In, in your business over there, New York Community Bank, who's one of the major multifamily lenders, they, they, pay, they want the broker to get paid as opposed to them earning a fee because they're, they're very interested in the originator, which you are. You're the originator, of the, you're the qualifier, and you're doing that. So you're doing an important role, and people are interested. So how do you decide on each one of them? I know because they were much younger than you. How do you decide to be active and look at these three businesses? So for LoftSmart and Morty, those were angel investments that I made prior to Camber Creek. For uh, my so viewers, I know what an angel investor is. Explain what an angel so investor an, is. So an angel investor is an early investor um, in a company where you find some sort of promise. And I think at you, at, with Morty, you guys hadn't launched yet, correct? Uh, that's correct. Right, and I think that's also the same with LoftSmart. I think you were just at the beginning stages. Yeah, Bowery was a little <laughs> bit different. <laughs> hadn't launched yet. You hadn't launched yet, but you also had, you had a product and you had, and, you, and like, like we were talking about earlier, you were putting the, together the pieces where we were able to also verify that you're, because Canberra Creek only invests once we figure out that we can actually utilize the technology within our broader LP, and we had been able to, to ascertain that pretty quickly during the diligence. But with, with these two gentlemen, uh, and as I'm, I, I said earlier, you look for a specific type of, of person, next factor. And both of them had something where not only were they passionate about their space, but you know, Brian's being modest, but he had a hand in, in certain uh, legislative attributes of the mortgage industry. And Sam took on a problem that he was facing personally head on and said, well, if not me, then who? And So and you, when you were at Virginia, you had this problem that you needed to find the room? Yeah, when I was a first year at the University of Virginia, um, back in 2013, I guess it would have been, um, you know, about a month into school, walked into a storefront property management office in Charlottesville, Virginia, and signed a lease on pen and paper and brought in a cashier's check for the deposit. They photo, or they, you know, they scanned my ID in order to run sort of a manual background check. Um, and, you know, fast forward a year, we moved into that apartment and we're sitting there and, you know, eating dinner the first night, all of a sudden the entire place starts to shake like an earthquake. And lo and behold, you know, hidden behind this park next to our apartment is, is a freight rail. And it goes by five, six times a day. None of us you really. See, if, if you grew up in the Bronx or certain yeah. parts of Brooklyn, it would be the subway. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Same as the freight rail. Right, but the fact sure. that he couldn't, that he didn't know that to begin with. You know, and I, and I thought to myself, how could this have been prevented, perhaps? And I think the answer that I sort of honed in on thinking about my use of other platforms like Yelp, like TripAdvisor, was if I had read just one review from a prior resident of that apartment who had said, you know, the train is kind of a bummer. Um, I don't know, is that five words? It, it could have been that simple. Um, and so I, I set out to create a platform where, you know, folks could find that kind of information and, and do so from people who could tell them what was wrong with an apartment or great about it before they moved in, not after, before they So how it. hard is it to, to raise money today for business? As I st stated at the beginning, the amount of money and the amount of transactions from 2008 to 2018, 2017, have been like a, a, 
a, a thousand times yeah. the number based on the statistics that was written up there. How difficult is it? Because, you know, a lot of people have a good idea, but a good idea doesn't mean it's going to turn into a business or a model that works. So I would love to say that, you know, me and my co-founders were brilliant and started this company in 2015 in the summer uh, by predicting that real estate tech was about to completely take off. Um, for us, that was, you know, largely good fortune. We saw an opportunity as in the space I, and felt we needed to before, solve it. Luck, the, uh, the it, L factor exactly. is very it's, important. It's also. crucial. Um, and so I think all of us have been fortunate to come along in a time when real estate tech is starting to garner such tremendous amount of interest in the venture community, and, and Jeff can speak to that. But I think I, raising money is hard. I don't care what anyone says, it is difficult. But there are a lot of sources of funding available, and specifically, just like John alluded to, that real estate tech is starting to have its moment in, in the sun. The issue is, when, from a VC perspective, is the idea good? Is the team behind the idea good? Is the market opportunity large enough to earn a venture return? And those are the questions that we have in the venture community where we say, look, you know, this might be a great idea and a smart, uh, a smart application, but the market is tiny. And so all of those things have to fit together before you can... Here's an interesting point, especially since I didn't elude my age, since, but I am the oldest in the group over here. Over 21. Okay, many years ago, a number of people were getting involved in day trading. Okay, it was, it was an interesting thing. I have a son who's a school teacher in Denver, he uh, teaches in high school, and one of his jobs before he, he wanted to go to law school was day trading. And I have a friend who was in the catering business, and he said, you know, maybe I should go into day, day trading. So it was something that everybody said, you know, it's so much easy I could go into this business. <laughs> and I believe in a similar manner, fast forward to 2018 in real estate tech, a lot of people might have an idea and they think they could go into it. Like we were talking about somebody else who was trying to get into the mortgage space, but doesn't understand that you have to be licensed if you want to do certain parts of the business. In the same manner in your business, somebody could go in there, but you need an MAI. Yeah. Your business, somebody can go in and compete also. And that's my next question. How hard is it for someone to replicate what you're doing? So, you know, this is a, a common question that you get when you are raising venture capital. It's, you know, what's your defensibility? What's your, your, your moat? And, uh, you know, I, I would harp on the licensing process and people were like, oh, no, that's just paperwork. That's just, you know, box checking and, and uh, it's not. And, and like the right combination of team and, and like having um, a sound operating model. Is uh, it more than one individual has to be licensed? So uh, everybody who... Um, Touches you know, a transaction. You know, so you can perform clerical and administrative functions and not be licensed, but basically anybody who does anything that's like meaningful in terms of, you know, negotiations or structuring credit or anything like that has to be licensed. It's not an easy process. And so that's where, um, you know, we've seen tech companies get in that really have no idea how to do mortgages and, and what that process is like, and, and they fail because they have great technology but no sense of how the, the industry and, and the regulatory product works. That's why Morty, I think, uh, you know, has been fortunate because we did have that right combination of, you know, modern, um, you know, digitally native technology and actual, um, you know, domain expertise and the ability to get state license. Um, it's a state-by-state -state process for every company that is not federally chartered. That represents the vast majority of uh, mortgage originators. And, and to be honest, As there are only... say, it's hassle. It's a hassle, but there are only a small handful of uh, mortgage startups that are actually doing loans, and, and that's you know a big piece of it. Yeah, I mean, for us, I think the biggest moat comes from this kind of internal network effect we're creating. Um, in order to design a software that is as robust as ours in the commercial appraisal space, you need to really know commercial appraisals. And because we have this software now, it allows us to recruit some of the top talent from the industry. So we have individuals from essentially both internally and through our partnership, all the top firms in commercial appraisals on our appraisal side of the, of the team. Then we have this engineering team, you know, led by Princeton grads, guys have been coding their entire lives, that is completely unique in our space. So your coders are here, they're not in Estonia, uh, India? It's or? a combination, but yeah, we have four senior engineers located in New York City. Um, and now we have these appraisers that we're getting that direct input from them to make the software better for them as experts in the space and our appraisers are getting more and more fluent in technology, 
our engineers know the appraisal space better than any engineers in the country. And so this kind of create, this network we're creating allows us to then iterate on the software, continue to hire the top talent from the space, as well as you know, college graduates that the appraisal space um, has really failed to recruit in a way that we now have a unique advantage because we are a tech company in the space we've never seen a tech company. Yeah, I think you know, for us the answer is sort of threefold. I mean, the first part of it is, is something that would be described in, by venture capitalists or in the tech industry as first mover advantage. And so we've spent two, two and a half years. I mean, the platform is active in 28 markets nationally, has almost 300,000 units on the instant lease product, works with everything from you know, local mom and pop property managers to national publicly traded REITs. Um, we have integrations with all the major management software suites. I mean, the barriers to entry have been incredibly high. Um, and so you know, we've spent two, two and a half years kind of breaking those down, building the right relationships, building product, acquiring customers, building brand. Um, and so that's that's a pretty big head start for anyone that wanted to jump into the space, I mean, truly. And then I think that sort of leads me into the second point, which is actually having the right strategic partners around us. And so, um, you know, we've done this with folks that we've put on the board of advisors. You know, Jeff is on the board of advisors. But, you know, in the, in the capital structure and in the folks we've raised, you know, investment from, we have strategic partners, you know, like Jeff, who's didn't invest through Camber Creek, but we kind of have access to his relationships and network. You know, we have the VC arm of Sterling Equities, which is the Wilpon family company, Corrigan Ventures, um, Metaprop, which is an investor in, in all three of us, um, which is exclusive really, you know, real estate focused and backed by companies like Zillow. Um, and so those kinds of partners have allowed us to have the right Rolodex in the aggregate to, to kind of build those relationships in a way that I think it would be very difficult for another company to get in front of the right well, people. One last question, are you profitable? How long is the normal life cycle for a company to be profitable? Well, that, that cycle can vary depending on, I mean, if you can ask that question of Amazon. No, no, I, no I, I'm just saying in the tech space, in the real estate tech. It really, it really depends because whether they're doing the land and expand and trying to, trying to cover the maximum amount of space to shut everybody out and then they can turn that profitability engine on like Amazon or whether the unit economics are focused on, okay, well, once you get to a number of, of mortgages or a number of appraisals, et cetera, then they'll be, then they'll be profitable. Okay. Yeah. So all I can say is I am so happy that my executive producer, Jeff, brought his buddies and great guys. And Sam, thank you. John, thank you. And Brian, even though you are that old, thank you. <laughs> okay. And I'm You got a new nickname though. Okay. And I, po and I'm positive that I, when I bring back you guys in a couple of years, it's only going to be Better and better. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. My hair's going to look like Jeff's when you bring us back in a couple of years. <laughs>